John's coming, he just stopped. How's that section? From a young age, I've always just had an undeniable, I guess, unexplicable urge to test my limits, to seek the best version of myself. For me, that has very organically come in the form of ultra running. So I guess the Grand Slam for me was simply the next logical step in that process of testing my limits. So I'm running four 100 mile races in 14 weeks. First one will be Old Dominion 100, June 5th. Western States, June 26th, Leadville 100, August 21st, and then the last one, the Wasatch Front 100, September 10th. Just find out so much about yourself in the course of covering 100 miles on foot. And with every ounce of my being, I know that I won't stop until I reach that finish line, that 400th mile. My name is Justin Kinner. I'm from Casper, Wyoming, and I am 34 years old. So I've been running since high school, um, and then in college, went, went, went to college and skied for the club Nordic ski team at the University of Wyoming, and then really got into the ultra scene, um, trail running, kind of found it late in college, and then um, did my first ultra in 2012. My brother, John, was definitely the one who um, I blame the most for getting me into ultra. Big mentor of mine, big idol of mine that um, started this whole process. The ultimate goal from a personal level is to, to just get it done. You know, whatever, whatever that entails. I mean, I don't concern myself with how fast I'm gonna run it or like racing people in a race too early. I mean, it's 100 miles. A lot can happen over the course of a day or however long it takes you. As long as everything goes goes well physically and you know I don't injure myself, I'm going to finish the Grand Slam this year. Being the first race I've done on the East Coast, um, there's always a lot more unknowns. Being being somewhere where you've never been, doing something in an area you've never been to, there's so much unknown with how my body is going to react physically, mentally to putting these four together in a summer. Nutrition it it, it changes a lot based on the time of day, how hot it is. I'm gonna be sticking with, as long as I can, just liquid calories tomorrow, so in the form of tailwind. Grabbing stuff at the aid stations that, that looks good. Maybe it'll be something salty, maybe it'll be something sweet. You, you look at like the six months that you've put into it, like maybe you're talking about doing a 100 mile race in a day. I mean like six months versus a day. I mean like where's the, you know, that's, that's the experience for me, not that, I mean, obviously the race is why you're doing that training, but my why isn't racing. My why is putting all this stuff together, you know, like your drop bags, you know, like this is, this is, this, this is the snapshot. Like I've tested all of this stuff in my training. I wouldn't be using any of this stuff if it wasn't in my race. I truly do believe that I could be finishing around 20 hours if everything's going great. Um, which that's the hope, but, um, but yeah, I'm not giving myself the option of finishing beyond 24 hours for this one. So that's just something that I've got in my mind and I'm not going to let it happen. The racers, the crews, the volunteers, the race directors, the ultra running community is, is the same. You know, it doesn't matter where you're running in this country. Everybody wants everybody to have, to find that success and, um, we'll do anything they can to get you to that finish line. May we have a beautiful day, and may we all gather back here again later on with great stories. In your holy name we pray, amen. 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 So 
in the in the course description, they they mentioned that there'd be pavement. They mentioned there'd be gravel. They actually mentioned gravel twice in their course description. The gravel roads were like packed gravel. I mean, it might as well have been pavement. Uh, yeah. That'd be How about? I kind of want to switch my shoes. Like this, this is just a okay. lot of pavement. Okay. It was definitely more than I was than I was expecting. The course description, um, like I said, informs you about it. It doesn't tell you that there's like 80% of the course is what that is though. <laughs> I got myself into kind of not a negative headspace early on in the race, but I did allow myself to get into a headspace where I was like, I don't care about 24 hours. I just want to get the finish, you know, get it under 28 so I can keep the Grand Slam alive. A bit of the struggle bus. That mindset kind of stayed, honestly, from like mile 30 when I switched out of my trail shoes into the road shoes really until probably about mile 86. I was just like, I was just kind of like, just moving along, forward progress. Like I said, never had a mindset that I wasn't gonna finish, but um, kind of was turned off to the idea of being competitive. But I think the biggest thing with the unknowns at an event like this is just being adaptable. I mean, being able to not let little things ruin your day. Just to be able to, you know, embrace the experience of what you're out there for. You can either let those changes, those hardships defeat you, or you can just keep moving forward. Who's on my crew for Old Dominion is uh, my mom and my dad, the stalwarts of my crew. Um, obviously, goes without saying I wouldn't be here without them, but... Uh, Having that experienced crew there is what I value the most. That is literally what gets me through those moments is having that crew there, just knowing that they're there at the start finish, they're waiting for you. The mental aspect of things is, is huge. I mean, the, you hear all the sayings about like, it's 70% mental and 30% physical. And I have, I have absolutely experienced that. Um, you reach a point where your body is physically exhausted, but your mind just keeps you moving forward. Having cramps on my in my like abductors, which I've never had before, so I don't know what that's all about. But I am just so ready for that freaking sun to go down. Seeing Justin set his goals and and you know support him in all of his training and you know all the trips. You always want your children to set high goals, set high expectations, and you you do everything you can to help them reach it. They get to that point where they're like 60 miles in and you see the energy level that he has. Then you get this level of comfort knowing that he's gonna at least make that time cut off so that he can continue the Grand Slam. I thought he seemed pretty good. Yeah, he, he just, I, I thought mean, so he, too. You know, he won, you know, he did, you know he's, he's coming to the next one. Yeah, we can. Okay, that'd, yeah, that that'd be, be nice. good. That'd be nice. Because he originally had said, give me a headlamp here. And he, when she said, you got two hours to get 10 miles, and he goes, don't give me the headlamp. That'll motivate me to get back yeah. there. Yeah. I'm like, okay, good. Yeah. My feet are freaking broken. Initially, just thinking about it, I it just seemed like a lot, but I, I just knew that because of how strong he is, that he could do it. I could see the, the toll that that took on his body, just the, the pounding of, of pavement, which he was not ready for, did not have any idea it was going to be like that. I don't think I can really call it doubts, but it was, it was hard to see, you know, to see him go through some of that. You see any snakes out there? I did. It wasn't until like 14 miles out, so like 86 miles, there was an aid station. 
before I looked at my watch and I had, was a little over three hours. So it was like a little over three hours and 14 miles left. I'm like, all right, I'll have to push. But at that point I knew that the rest of the race was gonna be on pavement. So I was like, well, if you wanna go get that sterling silver buckle um, to get under 24, this is the, this is the time to do it. Yeah. Hey, buddy. Woo! Good job. Anything else? Yeah. I'm just looking to get going. All right, dude. Rolling. Okay. Sure. All right, buddy. Pick it up a little bit. Woo! Do it. All right. Go. Go, go, go. There you go. As you get into town, as you got into Woodstock, they had the last aid station, which was little under two miles from the finish. Then you're just running through the town of Woodstock. You know, it's middle of the night, nobody's, nobody's out there. And so the only thing they say is to go to the next, the next intersection where you see the flashing sign, turn whichever direction that arrow is flashing. Are there signs where yes, I need to turn? Yes, there's, there's, there's a flashing, flashing light. light. That made sense, I was doing that. It was all good. And then as I got to the fairgrounds where we started, which was also the finish, um, they had one of those flashing signs, had one of those flashing lights um, pointing me into the fairgrounds. And for whatever reason, I mean, they didn't have the, the entrance to the fairgrounds um, lit up or anything. So I kind of was, I, not that I was thrown off by it. I think it was just kind of the fatigue of being on my feet for almost 24 hours at that point. Um, for whatever reason, I just kind of ran right by the, the entrance to the, to the fairgrounds and then um, Kind of the silver lining blessing in disguise was that they had a carnival going and I remember looking at looking out my right eye as I'm running by and I'm like, I just passed a Ferris wheel. And watching him jog by the entrance into the into the fairgrounds and I'm like going, Oh my gosh. And knowing that he was, you know, he's gonna be within a minute of making it. Old Dominion was June 5th, and uh, tomorrow's June 26th, so 21 days between Old Dominion and Western States, Squaw Valley to Auburn. Recovery was pretty typical, at least for me as, as far as 100 miles go. About a week out, I was still kind of feeling like a tingly sensation in my toes, and I'm sure that's probably a, due to the amount of pavement and packed gravel I was on. Excitement would be a, a vast understatement. Um, I mean, this is, like I said, this was the race that promised myself that if I if I got into Western, that would be the year that I would go for the Grand Slam and happened in my fifth year of putting in for it. So Adam will, will pace me from Forest Hill, um, mile 62 to Rucky Chucky. My brother John will be with me from 78, Rucky Chucky to Pointed Rocks, mile 94. Maggie will take me from mile 94 to um, Roby Point, 98.9. From 98.9, the plan is for all three of them to, to hop in from Roby Point to the finish. To be sitting here before the race I've been planning for for the last five years, pretty surreal, pretty awesome. I think the big thing tomorrow is just gonna be, like at Old Dominion, is just heat management, figuring out how to keep myself cool enough to, to keep moving forward. I don't sign up for these always knowing that I'm going to finish. If you did that, I think that would take away a lot of the intrigue to doing it if you just knew like, okay, I'm gonna finish this. To start somewhere and know where the finish line is, but not know what's going to happen between A and B. I mean, there's so many things that can happen, so many things that can go right, so many things that can go wrong. I feel like that's something that I've always been pretty, pretty good at, is being able to race my own race, not getting caught up with all the noise that goes around a race like Western States.
I'm John Kinner, and I'm Justin's oldest brother. So I mean, I'm his only brother, but I'm his oldest sibling. Justin talks about that that I'm the person that got him into all this. In some ways, that's true. Um, I was the first to kind of do this hundred mile thing. So he paced me at my first Leadville, first and second Leadville. And then I paced him at his first Bighorn, which was just the year after that. So 14, 15, and then 16 was his first Bighorn. We've done a lot of races together, so we essentially like kind of ran paced um, like Bighorn. We've done that a couple times now. A lot of people get super emotional finishing races like this. For me, it was more emotional getting him across this, his first finish. The opportunity to be able to do something like this um, together, to be able to run with him, to be able to support him in these runs as, much, as, as often as I've been able to, knowing that like that is a returning the favor as well because he's done that for me. Um, you know, we do that for family and friends so often, but in ultra running, it's such a tangible, you are literally there for me. to uh, the aid station here and uh, got about an hour and a half, oh, hour and a half, mile and a half hike. We should be expecting Justin sometime, let's see, it's almost eight o'clock. We should be expecting him probably 10 to 11. So somewhere in the range of two to three hours from now. So it'll be Western mountains versus Eastern mountains. Definitely more of the trails and mountains that I'm more accustomed to, more comfortable running in. There will be a lot more actual trail for this one, so running on single track. Um, I think there's maybe a grand total of like four miles of pavement for Western states. It's a little over 18,000 feet of gain and a little over 22,000 feet of descent. I feel like my legs are, are ready, prepared for that, that quad beating. Definitely that last canyon. Started to feel it warming up quite a bit. <laughs> so I actually had a, uh, I don't, I don't wanna go as far as saying it was a scare, but it was something that, that I was moderately concerned with up until Robinson Flat. So it was like 30 miles in. So I'd been doing tailwind just like I've been doing all summer. With the heat, I was concerned that I was gonna be sweating more than I, than I typically do. So I was kind of throwing some extra electrolytes on top of it. I would have this urge of needing to go to the bathroom, but like, couldn't. Okay, is this like kidney shut down? Like, I'm like, eh, this, this might not be good. You know, they asked how was it going. I'm like, eh, everything's good. But like in the back of my head, I had that going. I'm like, oh my goodness. Ultra running, you know, 100 mile races, it's kind of a microcosm of life. You gotta kind of adapt and change um, with the way things are going. And um, maybe it's because I've got too much electrolyte. So I just completely stopped taking the extra electrolyte tabs and everything went back to normal. I remember when I was first told my mom that she, her eyes got real big and I'm like, yep. And that's why I didn't tell you during the race because you were already concerned as it was. The crewing is, um, it, it's a challenge. And the, the biggest thing to me is I wanna be sure to have everything right for him because I know he likes to get into aid stations and get out as, as quick as he can. And so having everything laid out the way he wants it, I play a lot of that through my mind ahead of time. I'll read his instructions, you know, over and over just to make sure that we're getting things. Some of the times everybody's asking him something at the same time and it, I can tell that that he's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's <laughs> everybody's talking at the same time. But I, 
I love it, you know, I, I love to be able to, to help him and do, do whatever I can to, you know, help him be successful in this grand endeavor. <laughs> Cruising. Yeah, coming back from uh, Dusty Corner, dropping down to the canyon. It was like 105. Big reason for, you know, like, obviously I've done a lot of 100 mile races with Adam, with my brother. Maggie's, Maggie's always been there um, with Adam. And so to just have, have such close friends and um, more family present at this one really brings it a lot closer to, closer to home and kind of one of the bigger reasons why I love doing what I do and um, love doing this, love challenging myself in these ways around people who want to share in that experience with you. Um, so having the more the merrier is, is always how I feel about it and just the fact that they're they're willing to give up their time, hurry up and wait at aid stations. Um, it's not lost on me and it's something that I just appreciate them all immensely for and I know that there's a lot more people that want to be here. Just super excited to have have more people along for the for the experience, for the journey, and uh, want them to get as much out of it as they as they can. Let's also welcome myth number 307, Justin Kerr. Adam did an awesome job pacing me from, from Forest Hill to Rucky Chucky. We've done a lot of races together. We've had a lot of experiences on the trails together, but that was like the first time that either of us had paced each other. And it was still hot. Like the comments he was making, like, it's like, holy cow, it's still really hot. And I'm like, I'm glad, I'm glad it's not just me. I'm glad that you can, cause I mean, he's done some hot hundreds as well. And he made a comment like, this is the hottest I've ever been. Uh, John, I would plan on drinking more than you think you will. It's toasty out. I've got a couple good. I had one time out fresh where I went through a leader. Yeah, we got a bathroom here. So, I mean, yeah, I, I never really felt like I cooled down really until, you know, like crossing Rocky Chucky. And then even after, I mean, you're, you're cooling down because you're in the river. But um, at that point, it was just, even once you, once we got across the river, like we dried off quick and it was still warm. It was hot, but I mean, like, you just remind yourself, like, it's not, it's not just hot for you. Everybody who's out here is dealing with this. Um, reminding yourself to not put yourself on an island that, you know, everybody's suffering. It's not, it's not just you. I think we're, we're out we there. Are. Roughly like five miles left. Yeah. It's l not looking like he's going to make that under 24 hour cut off but he's definitely uh you know gonna make that cut off to you know keep working on the the grand slam which that's that's his ultimate goal it's been a pretty brutal day in terms of the heat and you know of course he's he's running with his brother right now so that's you know a little extra boost there One of the big things that always keeps me moving forward in those kind of darker moments is the amount of time, the amount of energy that I've put into, into doing this and um, just being mentally prepared, physically prepared. In the back of my mind always is just the people, um, family, friends um, that have helped me along the way. And on the top of the track, a Wyoming boy. 
Bay through and through. Wearing bib number 307 that he wears for all the people of his awesome state. Leadville was known for the gold rush and the silver rush. When the mines weren't producing gold and silver anymore, Leadville was headed towards just becoming a ghost town. And that was when they uh, had this idea of starting this race series, you know, back in 1982, I think was the first year that they did it. This race series has done a lot for this town, for the community, Leadville. It was the Leadville 100 that, you know, like, I saw my brother, who's always been that mentor figure for me, like saw him really struggling here. And I'm like, holy crap, this is like one of the strongest dudes I know. He is at his limit. That was where it really kind of struck a tone for me. It was like, I want to do this. Like I want to do Leadville sometime, but like I want I want to try to run 100 miles. I want to do it. I'm going for my ninth hundred now. So <laughs> there's my crew dog. <laughs> oh, that's definitely making it. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Hi, honey. Here's the crew dog. Yep. So there's the addition to the crew this week. The buildup this summer has been um, not exactly what I expected, but in a good way. I mean, like, the time in between Western and Leadville has, has, has left a lot of time for reflection and left a lot of time for recovery for my body, kind of both mentally and physically, um, to where I'm at a point now where I feel, I, I, I'm feeling really good, um, physically, mentally. Each, each race, like the buildup, you know, like, first race, it was just mom and dad and you. Second race, it was Maggie, Adam, my brother, my parents, and then different friends, uh, Nathan, and then Katie, uh, John's girlfriend. Now it's my whole freaking family. It's, it's so hard to put into words how cool it is being back in Leadville, you know, like towing this line for myself, where it all kind of started. For John and I to both be doing this at the same time, um, same day, um, really just adds to the excitement. I was very giddy when I was packing drop bags for Leadville. Just like I, I had packed some cool gear, cold weather gear for Old Dominion and Western, just kind of in optimistic, <laughs> trying to wish some, some good things upon me and upon the other racers that we were gonna have some cool weather, but obviously it didn't happen at Old Dominion or Western, but um, had a good feeling that it was gonna happen at Leadville. And like I said, it was just giddy to, to have some cold weather gear and actually actually use it because I think more people tend to perform better in, in cooler weather and it was definitely was a lot colder than I was expecting it to be in that uh, outward bound area just kind of right there in the middle of everything I think that cool air all just dipped into that valley and made it a little colder than I was expecting but it, it felt refreshing felt rejuvenating definitely didn't feel as many aches and pains that I, that I sometimes feel when it's when it's hotter out so yeah it was very welcome weather. <laughs>
multiple things that are challenging with Leadville. Um, obviously the fact that you're at 10,000 feet. So you're at elevation for the entire time. Aside from Hope Pass and some stuff over Sugarloaf Pass, it's not super technical, so it's a very runnable course. And I think that's what can kind of get people into, into trouble with it is um, they go out, too, go out a little bit too fast, realize the oxygen debt isn't going away because you're still at that, that elevation for the entire race. As you're fatiguing, your muscles are fatiguing, you've still got that lack of oxygen. The elevation gain that you get uh, over Leadville is around 15, 15, 5. It's an out and back, two pretty significant climbs, so up and over a Sugarloaf Pass. Then the other big climb that people always talk about is, you know, going up and over Hope Pass, 12,600 feet, right near the turnaround. Fortunate to go up and over that once, and then you get to come back. A very iconic stage of the race. Breathtaking views, I mean, both physically and psychologically, because I mean, you're at 12,600 feet and just views for days, I mean, in all directions. There's some pretty fun aid stations on it. The aid station that they have right below the summit of Hope Pass is really cool. I mean, it's hauled in by alpacas and llamas. I mean, it just gives you an idea of kind of the, the technicality of the terrain. It takes a super dedicated group of volunteers to go there. That's an area where I, I know that a lot of people, that's their biggest struggle with Leadville. So to just see everybody at those limits, still going with all the reason in the world to not be going. Just that sheer power of will that each person has. We see people in that pain cave, in that well, either defeating those limits or succumbing to them. I was looking forward to seeing John coming back um, on his way back towards Twin Lakes. And that was kind of my motivation at that moment was just, I was gonna see my brother soon. It was, uh, it was just nice to be with somebody again and uh, obviously be with my brother, um, kind of in that situation of both of us being in the same race, but still, you know, hiking up Hope Pass. I mean, it was like kind of just deja vu all over again back to 2014 and 15 when I was hiking up it with him. I'd run Leadville before twice. Um, Justin had paced me the two, the two times I ran. He'd never run it before. Um, so he knew a ton of the course since he'd paced a bunch of it. Plan wasn't to run it together. And then we've kind of caught up with each other at 50 miles and ran, essentially paced each other for 50 miles of that race too. So. Racing together is different than pacing together, but in some ways, in some ways it's not. Um, when we have a relationship like we have, it's, I guess some families might get real competitive in that situation, but for us it wasn't. It was just like, I was happy to see him. I was in a low place when he, when he found me. We, we lifted each other. Doing that one together was big because Leadville holds a special place in my heart. Yeah, we just want to come.
just watch yeah, this because it's super shit. Yeah. I am just, I will, we're both just freaking wrecked. God. Yes, that's kind of just a good This is silly. This is silly. There's peaks, there's valleys, there's long, dull sections where you're just like thinking about what in the world am I doing out here? Like, holy crap, it's been you know, 18 hours and we're still, still doing this. I mean, just, this is hard. <laughs> this is really freaking hard. It's hard because, because I put myself in that situation and I prepared myself for that situation. And that's, and that's, and that's why you do it. You don't do it thinking it's gonna be easy. You know, like in those moments when I'm low, like, you know, you're fine. It's not, it's not getting worse. It was good. Yeah, we had a good time. It was fun, lots of laughs. Yeah, we kept, we did, we stayed pretty true to the like, walk the hills, run the flats, run the downs. So they stayed, they were, they were good. Little turmeric pills. I just go back to again, I like the support system that I have and the faith in, in myself and my ability and like the fact that I've, I've put in a strong body of work to get me here. I know I don't have like what a lot of people would consider like an elite speed, but what I do have is I have an elite support system um, that has gotten me to this point. I feel like I've kind of just got an elite grit. Just keep moving forward when it would be so much easier to just stop. Coming back from May Queen, I mean, so we had just just under 13 miles to go, and um, looking at my watch, Nathan's looking at his watch, and I'm like, well, we're gonna need to be averaging a little bit better than four miles an hour to get back under that 25 hours, which we hadn't done in a while. There was a little bit more of a sense of urgency, I think, on my end than there was John. I think John was just in a place mentally there where. I think he was there, but not like all there. And we, we, we're all, there's always a point in these races where somebody's, it's, that was just his time at May Queen. I don't think that he really understood like, okay, we're, we're kind of under the, we're under the gun here. If we want to do this sub 25, get the big belt buckle. You could tell Nathan wanted to go. And I was like, nope, we're finishing this together. Like, doesn't matter if it's 25 hours in one minute. We had we had kind of already made that decision, not really talking about it, that we were gonna finish together. Just around three hours of the finish line, it's like, okay, well, it's becoming a lot more real. If we wanna do this, we're gonna need to kick it into gear. Yeah. That moment of like, starting that race together, and then continuing and being able to cross that finish line together um, was a really, really emotional moment. Couldn't imagine um, a more fulfilling experience. It's not at all how we had both kind of planned for the day to go. Can't imagine a, a better scenario for how, how the way things ended up going around. That was, a pretty indescribable moment. The way that it happened was just, I mean, like, I mean, it was like literally the stuff like storybooks are made of.
cautiously optimistic with how I'm feeling, for sure. I definitely don't feel as tapped out as I did after Old Dominion or Western. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's just kind of accumulation of buildup from the summer, um, the body responding to the stimulus, the stress. Definitely feel rested, feel recovered. So excited about the prospect of that and the prospect of this being the last one, the last of the four. I mean, I've always taken an approach of you know, taking it one at a time, trying not to fall in that trap of thinking about what's ahead. I mean, everything's in the rear view mirror and there's nothing really in the too near future of what's next to come. So I'm excited to see what maybe that might trigger in me tomorrow. I don't, I don't know what's gonna happen. The familiarity is definitely good, you know, doing it in 2019, but sometimes that can be not so good because you do know what's coming. Thinking about a hundred mile race from the start is like, that's, it seems pretty monumental. Just kind of tackling each section as its own entity in the progression of getting yourself to the finish line is kind of how I've always attacked it. Three, two, one. a start right here in Kaysville, East Mountain Wilderness Park. 4,000 foot climb in the first four and a half miles. So it's right in your face. It's right there. It's, um, it's there for everybody. Twenty-four thousand feet of gain, and then a little bit under that for descent. Definitely the most of the four for the Grand Slam. The most of a race that I've done. It is a very pretty course. I mean, it is very accurately depicted as a hundred miles of heaven and hell. If I had to describe the hell section, it would probably be between thirty-two miles and forty-six, forty-seven miles. There's just no. No reprieve from the sun, no reprieve from the heat. There's really no cover. Yeah, it's just really hot. I mean, I remember that section being really hot in 2019. Looks like it's gonna be even possibly a little bit hotter tomorrow. Can pretty confidently say it's probably not gonna be as hot as it was at Western. Uh, the whole family's gonna be here again, minus the nephews and niece. They all have four different pacers. So brother-in-law Chris will be pacing me. Um, then Phil, big guy that planted the seed and you know, the, the Grand Slam paced him here in 2017 and his last leg of the Grand Slam. So being able to get to run a section of course with him, that'll be super fun. And then John will pace me from Brighton. And then my sister Jen's gonna pace me, planning to pace me from top of the wall. Beyond words, beyond blessed to have the tribe, have the people that I have with me along for the journey, it just makes it that much more um, fulfilling and that much more, you know, like motivation to keep keep moving forward. There's a point where, you know, like you could just, I mean, and I think about it, like I could just be done, you know, like I'm fine, but you realize like, yes, it hurts, but it's not getting worse. Can you bear this pain? Can you bear this feeling for X amount of hours and get yourself to your end goal? The overwhelming answer for me has been yes, I can, because it's 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 something that I crave. I, I search for those moments. I crave those moments. Where I can, where I can truly challenge myself and feel, you know, like the most alive. In those moments, challenging myself in, or surrounded by like-minded people in beautiful surroundings, like there's nothing better. <laughs> there's nothing better. You know, there weren't a ton of lows. I didn't have like I had at Leadville, you know, of thinking about what's what's coming, I guess, and maybe that's because there's nothing really 
in the foreseeable future here. Um, so just being able to stay present was was a lot easier at this one because uh, there isn't anything planned in the foreseeable future. It's not. Overall, I'm feeling okay. Yeah. Definitely feeling the heat. Tea. Tea gets just an emotion. It's just an emotion. That's right. So, yeah, really no lows. I mean, just like the usual kind of like, good lord, this is hard. And it's still X amount of miles from the finish. And just like, but nope, stay present. And Phil did an awesome job with that. Like, just keeping me present. And he's like, think about it as. 355 miles of 400. I'm like, I like that, Phil. That was, that was really helpful. So then as the race kind of progressed, it was like, all right, 360 of 400, 375 of 400. There were sections that definitely, the miles just seemed to tick off a little quicker because they were, but, um, and then just sections that just drug on because it's the terrain and just the brutal, the brutalness of it. You know, I try really hard to not let doubt like self-doubts or anything creep into creep into my head but i mean like to say that there weren't any doubts would be would be false um i mean because i mean there's just so many things that need to go right for you to get to the starting line of an event like this let alone get to the finish line i mean it's a perfect storm of events that leads to that happening getting to the start line getting to the finish line so like going going down the face of those mountains like there's consequence you take a step to the right you know take a little mess step to the right or the left and at different sections and like your side of a mountain and you're sliding down like maybe you break a leg maybe you twist your ankle and you have to be and you have to be done having that you know kind of faith in yourself and and, and your ability it's it speaks volumes it gets you places and um yeah, I think just having that faith in yourself um, to kind of outweigh any doubts that might creep in is, is huge. Okay. It, it would be so easy to just stop, you know, end the, end the struggle, end the pain, but you, it comes down to a choice. like. Okay, how much, how, how important is this to you? Because yeah, like I said, it's it, it would be so easy to just you know like end the struggle, end 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 whatever pain you're feeling, and just just be done, you know. And it's 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 over. I mean, and you get that instant gratification of okay, it's over. Like I feel I feel better now that I'm done. But then, how long do you have to live with that? Then you know, like how long does that last? That's not something I want to find out. Before this summer, I had an idea in my head of what this experience, this journey would mean to me, this 14 weeks. I can't describe it any better than to say that that idea was completely blown out of the water. Everything surpassed my expectations, everything. It was about so much more than just running four 100 mile races in 14 weeks. <laughs> First thing that comes to mind is the even stronger connection it created with my family. Then there's the deeper connections I was blessed to forge with my friends who so graciously sacrificed their time to be a part and the excitement I have to repay those wonderful favors. From the bottom of my heart, I simply cannot express my love and gratitude towards each of you. There's just so much that goes on, so many sacrifices that brought all of us to that 400th mile. The microcosm of living a life in a day that ultra running provides 
and how running has shaped my life to become such a huge part of me, and how it makes me reflect on my time with running and how it has changed. Coming to the realization that chasing 400 was not the end, but merely a checkpoint in my journey, and carries with it the unbridled excitement for what comes next. So, uh, who are you? How old are you? And what are you? <laughs> I'm Justin Kenner, I'm 34 years old, almost, I'll be 35 next week, but, um, and I am a Grand Slammer. <laughs> And I, he goes, man, it just hurts when I sit. And I said, well, if it hurts when you sit, does it hurt any more when you walk? No, it's the same. Does it hurt any more when you run? And he said, no, it's the same. And I said, well, if it's all the same hurting, then you might as well run because you can at least get, get it over with faster, you know? And he kind of looked at me and kind of smiled and shook his head and got up and took off, you know? 